can hear me fine okay thank you all right uh, thank you all for coming here this afternoon i hope you all well <coughs> uh, so i am uh, hussein abbas that's me uh, uh, i currently work as a director for drupal practice at accelerant uh, and basically my job is to define best practices and oversee the entire you know whatever we do with drupal at accelerant that's that's uh, that's my job uh, i'm also contributed to the whole drupal ecosystem since uh, some time now i think about 5 years for co uh, it's on and off you know it's uh, but the you know contributing to drupal co contrib and you know the entire php ecosystem has uh, helped me a lot so i would i would encourage you to uh, you know try it out if you're Okay, so we are going to talk about designing a CI/CD systems uh, system for decoupled Drupal systems, um, and uh, I'm going to like be as generic as possible. But you know, specifically, I'll I'll take examples from a system we built some time back at Accelerant. Um, I'll describe more about that. Um, it was a, a decoupled system, Drupal 8 in the back end and Angular front end, and it was a multi-site, multi-cloud, multi-environment. We'll we'll get to that. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, you, you know, and, and I mean beginning of the DevOps era. You know, what are the typical practices that uh, you know that we saw at that point point of time? Uh, so before before there was cloud, before there was cloud, you know, we had uh, software being shipped on floppies and CDs and stuff like that, right? And you know. then we had cloud and you know websites and saas products and everything and software could be shipped real time but uh, since there was this culture of shipping things on floppies and cds you know with a specific time frame uh, that habit lingered and uh, you know we have uh, even now you know i think uh, many organizations they have this practice of uh, deployments being a huge thing you know you stop everything else when you going to do, deploy something uh, basically it's a, it's a huge dramatic event and uh, it doesn't have to be that way you know i'm sure it's it's not a new thing you know people people are very familiar with systems where deployments happen even 10 times a day more than that even so let's talk about that and let's st start by talking about something which is very critical to every deployment human beings uh well this is not really surprising it it could be shocking i know that but it's not surprising uh, we are not consistent you know and that makes us unreliable why you no know, because people are complex entities you know we're not simple you know we're not simple machines you know where you put in one input and you get one output we get bored easily okay we forget to follow instructions and even if we have instructions and we, even if we remember to follow them we can easily misinterpret what the instruction is trying to tell us but also people <coughs> they are creative you know they they can understand intent there is you know you don't have to you know people don't do exactly what they are told but they can understand intent and do what is necessary not what is told they can solve complex problems that to creatively and people are awesome right so there are these you know people like i said they're complex entities you know they're not one thing but 
we need people to be able to solve uh, things creatively so how do we how do we make sure that people uh, do the best job while recognizing that you know people get bored easily how do we solve problems that happen when when, when people uh, you know like out of boredom you know I'm, i'm sure you must have heard stories of you know someone typing out rm dash rf slash and deleting the entire server uh, entire operating system it's it's happened so how do we make sure those problems don't happen while allowing people to solve complex complex problems and of course you know that's that's where we get to automation uh, so how do we bridge these two aspects you know how do we automate those parts that are boring that are repetitive and let people do the creative work so that that's you know that's that's the promise of the devops era right now uh, and when i say devops the whole revolution uh, you know we in fact heard a lot today morning about this you know something uh, to this effect uh, you know what is devops is it a tool chain or is it a culture right and we heard a lot about you know how devops is a culture today morning and i agree i happen to agree you know by the way whatever we heard in keynote today morning uh, something we do practice we we live those uh, those practices at accelerate uh, i like to think of devops as these three c's and uh, I, i don't know if i've read this somewhere but you know it's just something that i identify with uh, first thing is culture devops primarily is about people all coming together and agreeing to follow one specific uh, protocol maybe uh, but but it's it's that understanding <coughs> excuse me it's that understanding that uh, everybody is going everybody understands all the steps of an entire software life cycle that's development and deployment the operations part you know of devops uh then it's collaboration like i said you know people need to talk to each other people need to understand each other everybody needs to be on the same team the same page so to speak uh when we are talking about how are we going to roll out uh, a software artifact to the servers or wherever they need that needs to live and continuous improvement and and we will we'll be talking about continuous again and again this thing i, I think this this word appears almost every way whenever we talk about devops so we'll talk about continuous integration i think uh, you know whatever we said about earlier uh, and of course the topic of this session as well is about building a continuous integration uh, pipeline and uh, these are the three main things i identify when i say continuous integration these are the three main things uh, of course you can split it up but basically you prepare the uh, environment where you're going to do whatever you're going to build your software and you're going to test it that it works as expected this is i think like the most basic uh, nuts and bolts of continuous integration and then we get to deployment and that as a step saying deploy now to make this work to make this deployment work you know again our objective here is to make deployments boring that you don't have to think about it So to make this work you need to make sure that your tests have reasonable coverage if because if it does not have coverage if you're testing the wrong thing you don't know the thing that you're building and automatically deploying if that thing is going to work you don't know that so uh, if you want to put deployment in your in, as a part of your ci uh, pipeline you need to make sure test test uh, have a reasonable coverage and i don't mean test everything uh, i think uh, you know we'll talk about you know what what tests look like in a later slide but yeah test the right thing you know the those things that are important for your business are they working realistically you know uh, we have you know we we discussed those uh, three things early on but realistically we do have Uh, a more elaborate pipeline in typical ci chains uh, nowadays we don't really have a prepare explicit prepare stage uh, this is more from um, you know the jenkins time of uh, world you know where you explicitly had to check out the repository but nowadays it's like most ci pipelines or uh, ci tools 
they would just uh, they, they would have, you know you you'd be starting with a repository already and then you do your thing you know uh, you would have things like static code checks uh, by the way is there anyone here who does not understand static code checks just so that i understand okay that, that's that's great uh, so static code checks then you build the thing test deploy and acceptance tests so before we get into tools i would like this take this opportunity if anyone has questions so we we spoke about the culture the the you know like theory so to speak so far and now we'll talk more about tools and the specific example that i mentioned earlier the case for the decoupled website but before that if there are any questions i would like to take them now or i mean of course at the end as well all right uh, so i think any devops presentation worth its salt has a mention of docker uh, it doesn't have to be docker any container any containerization technology does but drupal is kind of ubiquitous it's kind of i mean like you know when you say container containers people probably mean docker and uh, you know docker images are a good place to start because on you know there are 2.35 million images on docker actually i think the number today is around 3.2 million this is a little slightly old slide uh, so there are 3.2 million images on docker docker hub and that's just docker hub you know there are many other docker registries out there uh, like i said many more elsewhere and of course the you can create your own images that was that's pretty basic one of the docker images that i use uh, specifically with drupal is this uh, that's me I'm, <laughs> of course i wrote it so i would be using it uh, this is uh, this this docker image contains uh, you know some of the code snips uh, from the coder module uh, you know the you might have used this php cs with drupal standard or drupal practice standard it includes that uh, it includes drupal secure snips but um, it doesn't really work with uh, the latest versions of php cs so it's there but it's not enabled by default there is pa review.sh uh, anyone here who wants a walk through of pa review like familiar with pa review everyone anyone not uh, come across pa review before uh, i'm sorry have you come across or have you not come across okay so pa review is a kind of like a sh uh, shell script which uh, basically runs php cs with those standards so uh, the idea is that you know whenever you write a module a custom module or a contrib module you would you can you can use this peer review uh, script on that module it will give you a list of all the issues found that you know that it found with your module uh, mostly to do with uh, you know drupal coding standard but uh, you know things with like uh, drupal practice and drupal secure they also highlight things that could be potential bugs or potential security vulnerabilities uh, it's it's kind of a static code uh, static uh, code analysis you know not not php stand it's like a more on a on a more basic level uh, i'm happy to talk about this uh, later if you want you can you can catch up with me or you can just do a search for uh, any of these peer review or uh, php cs then there is drupal check uh, drupal check is an uh, is an uh, wrapper around php stand um i'm forg i'm forgetting the name i'm sorry the person who wrote it matt um Matt Glam, he wrote this. NMD Matt. I remember the Twitter handle. <laughs> I think that that's how we recognize people in the online community by the Twitter handles and by D dot O names. But I think it's NMD Matt. Uh, I'm I'm forgetting the name. I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a wrapper on PHP Stan, and PHP Stan is a more comprehensive static analysis tool. And I would recommend you check that out. Uh, even without Drupal check, you can use it with your uh, regular PHP projects if you're if you're using that. and this image is actually based on a, another image called uh, uh, i'm not really sure how to pronounce that jkzda/phpqa so it contains all the tools that that has it combines it and this image is by the way it's uh, uh, like uh, you know uh, it supports php 7.1 to 7.4 7.1 is not supported it's just there for like you know archival reasons so this is about the image it it's uh, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me 
So this image uh, contains a lot of tools that you might want to run during your testing phase or static code phase. Uh, and and like, like I said, you know, I man maintain this image, so if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, reach out to me later. And then there are CI tools themselves. Um, uh, these are four which I have used personally. Am I forgetting something from this list? Um, maybe, but like these are the four, four I have used most. Uh, today we are going to talk mainly about Jenkins, uh, even though I, I think I pretty much used all the other three more than Jenkins. Uh, but uh, this project, uh, we implemented the CI system with Jenkins, uh, so we'll talk about that. But yeah, I, I think the most I've used is GitLab CI. Anyone has any preferences over here? The techniques that I mentioned are equivalent, you know, uh, they, they work with any CI tool, there's nothing special. But we'll be talking about Jenkins today. So let's talk about, you know, what, an, what a flow looks like. Um, a CI flow, you know, CI pipeline run, what does it look like? Uh, the first thing that you should aim for is developer ease. And the reason is simple that uh, if it is not easy to run, people won't run it. People will stop looking at it. And I've seen that happen in my teams. Uh, if the CI, for example, if, it's like, if it runs in some corner and, you know, nobody even looks at it, nobody bothers with it. You know, things move on and like this very valuable tool just is there. It's just they're unused. It should be fast. Uh, if you if the developers are expected to wait like uh, about 10 minutes, 20 minutes for each build, people get bored. You know, people again stop paying attention to that. And when they see later that okay, there was an error, there is a they, they've already moved on to other things. You know, there is a context shift, and people find it difficult to come back to this task. So it has to be fast. Uh, it should test the right thing. I mentioned this earlier. It does not have to, each CI run does not have to test each and everything. Okay, test the right thing. Uh, because one of our concerns is the speed of the run as well. So you might want to, you might, you might decide that, okay, uh, for every push on, on a feature branch, you would just be looking at uh, like, you know, very basic tests like static code check tests and uh, maybe just unit tests. But uh, once you push to a staging branch or, you know, like before you're about to merge, you might want, want to run all the functional tests as well, which typically take more time. Uh, and you might even decide that there might be some test room, like commonly called a smoke testing and all that, which, uh, which take a lot of time. You might want to run that on a nightly basis. It doesn't stop merge and everything, but you still get daily feedback about what's happening. So again, uh, there is no... There's no uh, standard practice here. It's what works for your project, size of your project, the needs of your project, the, si the size of the team and everything. And uh, notifications. And this might seem like an odd thing, uh, you know, odd thing over here, but it's actually very relevant because if, if there are no notifications, it's very, very easy to overlook that there is a CI test running somewhere. Uh, uh, tests and all this deployment and everything, that it's actually running somewhere. Uh, so. We use Slack internally to accelerate, so it was it, it was very obvious that we just uh, put in a Slack plugin, and whatever happens in the build, it gets sent to Slack, where the team is actually working, and uh, they see if there are any errors, they see it immediately. So I talk about uh, a bit about our experience with Jenkins. The developer experience is not that great and I'm sure Jenkins is changing that now with its uh, I again forgot the name of the the revamp they're working on right now um, it, it's blue ocean. yeah 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 blue ocean yeah that's right blue ocean yeah so uh, we didn't use that we use the state you know like uh, the mainstream version of Jenkins and the developer experience is not that great as in for someone who wants to configure the pipeline. Uh, like I said, I have experience with the other CI tools and I like everything, the entire CI configuration to live within the repository itself. Uh, like a GitLab CI.yaml or Circle CI.yaml file, something like that. So we did something like that. Jenkins, of course, it does support uh, pipeline input uh, using some plugins. And uh, the, it, the cool thing about that is that the pipeline can be written using Groovy. Uh, the Groovy language, and uh, that actually makes it more powerful than the other CI tools I've used because the other CI pipelines can are just declarative, 
and your Jenkins file can be declarative as well, but you can actually write it as a script. Third party support, Jenkins has been around for a long time, so third party support is pretty good. Uh, integration with our workflow, again, because we had plugins for every thing that we needed, the integration also worked out. <coughs> it is customizable and it is secure. Uh, security comes in, I mean, of course, uh, security comes in at the level of locking down your builds, but also at the level of how you pass uh, things like secrets to your application, uh, to your build process. Uh, so like uh, in this case, we needed to pass in AWS keys and uh, Aliyun keys. Aliyun is uh, uh, like an AWS equivalent for Alibaba Cloud. Uh, so we need to pass those keys and many other things in, in it, like basically the, the secret management and Jenkins has its own uh, secret management layer, which is, I mean, that can be, called, that, that can be extensible, but again, the one that comes with Jenkins is pretty good too. Uh, now that is Jenkins. Our case was with uh, decoupled Drupal. So when we needed, when we uh, when we went about uh, planning about uh, planning our pipeline, we had to consider these. That uh, uh, this was uh, this was like I said, this was a multi-site architecture. We had five. I think later on we had one more six Angular websites. Uh, only one backend. Uh, so there were multiple websites, but it was all served on a single backend. A typical multi-site architecture. Uh, then we had, you know, because we have all these repositories, we wanted to reuse code. So we had some more repositories for uh, storing infrastructure related code. Um, uh, so, you know, after this uh, session at 4 p.m., I'm talking, I'm going to talk about Terraform as well. Again, the same project, but how we handle the infrastructure side of things. So we had repositories which, uh, which defined the entire infrastructure as a Terraform module. And Ability to share all of this configuration. You know, we needed that. Uh, so, so uh, the other CI tools that we commonly used, it's not very simple to mix and match different repositories. But since Jenkins is kind of programmatic in nature, uh, it was straightforward. You know, how, how do we pull in common pieces of code? You know, uh, libraries, so to speak. And again, I'll, just, I'll come to some examples. <coughs> This is, uh, I don't know if this, no, if it's, it's a little blurred, but I think it's visible. <coughs> so this was our CI workflow and every time there is a push, a developer pushes uh, some code, uh, we used GitLab. And uh, so the GitLab, it sends, uh, you know, it fires off a webhook to Jenkins, which starts the entire CI uh, run. And uh, we configured that it would run on all, all branches, but uh, deployment only happened on certain branches. So a few things, uh, the, the backend lived on Acquia servers. Uh, are you familiar with Acquia Site Factory, many chance? It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an Acquia product, uh, allows you to build, uh, spin up additional multi-sites you know, using the UI. Uh, <coughs> so we had to deploy to Acquia Site Factory. Uh, for the backend, and for the front end, we deploy front end application. Uh, well, not through Terraform precisely. Uh, we deployed it using AWS and Alion's own tools, but uh, we created the infrastructure using Terraform. <coughs> and in the initial stages, that happened through uh, for each CI push. Um, and the reason for that was, like I said, there were five different uh, websites in the beginning, and each website. Uh, some of them could go to multiple clouds on both AWS and Aliyun. And for each website, you would have four different environments. A production environment, staging and develop and a testing environment. Uh, so we had to maintain, even using Terraform, we had to maintain, uh, you know, at that time, I think around 24 different uh, instances of our, our entire front-end architecture. And uh, that changed. Initially, we iterated a lot, you know, we identified what worked, what didn't work, and we changed. So we just put Terraform in our pipeline so that uh, whenever we deploy a particular environment, Terraform would run and it would uh, uh, update the environment. And like, you know, we'll talk about Terraform in the next session at 4 p.m. Eventually, the, the, the implementation matured and we didn't have to run Terraform, so we just removed that part. We just left the deployment part in. Um, 
that the actual pushing of files from uh, you know the build artifact to AWS or Allium, uh, and, and like the deployment was basically moved to S3, uh, AWS S3 or Allium OSS. It's the equivalent of S3. And uh, yeah, through, uh, all the steps used to happen using Docker. Uh, the Docker server actually lived on another machine, so uh, that's not a very big deal. It's it's uh, Docker is a server client architecture anyway. Uh, so all the <coughs> all the tasks themselves executed in Docker containers. Uh, we also had additional code quality checks through Sona Cube server, and then any notifications that needed to be sent, we would send that to Slack. And yeah, that, that was essentially our whole uh, workflow. So this is what our pipeline looked like for Drupal backend. And uh, it's very you know simple. We just check out, which is similar to prepare. Uh, very, very basic linting, code quality checks. Code quality checks are just those PHP CS checks I mentioned earlier. Build is uh, composer install, pretty much. You know that, That's the only thing that you need for Drupal. And then static analysis, and that was uh, PHP stand. So uh, th this happens after build because PHP stand needs the whole, uh, all the dependencies installed. It cannot just work on the, uh, on on, uh, on your uh, on on the code you want to check. It actually builds an entire tree of uh, all your code, including dependencies. So it needs to run after build, and then finally deploy. Uh, and uh, this is yellow because. Uh, that's a different story. We needed a lot of time to figure this out, figure this whole pipeline out, you know, and the team was already moving. And by the time this pipeline was effective, uh, sorry, implemented, the team had already made some uh, less than optimal decisions. And of course, we didn't want to break bills for that. So we, uh, nothing serious, but you know, things like, uh, uh, mostly like you know, warnings that um, like, for example, cyclomatic complexity was 11 instead of our threshold, which was 10. So we let that go. We took all of those as uh, technical debt issues for our latest print. And we just marked this builds as yellow. Uh, and, you know, Jenkins has, like, Jenkins is pretty solid. It gives you lo logs for all of these different stages. Linting was... Uh, it will just check, you know, syntax errors in different PHP files. Very, very basic. And then code quality checks go a little bit deeper, runs actual PHP CS tests. And then uh, you have build, which is essentially composer, uh, composer install, like I said. And uh, yeah, that, that's uh, that's about the backend. For front end, the, uh, the pipeline is a little bit more elaborate. And uh, one of the reasons is, uh, like I said, we actually deployed to multiple clouds. So you see that you know we are actually and, and multiple environments as well. So in um, cases like these, you know, we are actually first building the dev <coughs> environment and deploying it, and then building the dev environment for Aliu. And we need to do this twice because uh, the architecture for application was completely uh, completely server generated. So. Um, the it it got its data from a Drupal backend, right? And that uh, that U URL needs to uh, that URL needed to be in, uh, hard coded inside these files, because these files are served from an S3. Uh, you know, there is no opportunity for modifying these files during runtime. It's just these HTML files which are directly cached on even at a CDN level. So we had to generate these HTML files with the appropriate API endpoints hard coded. So we have to repeat our builds for. Uh, it, uh, like you know, we have to first build for AWS and then also build for Aliyun. And uh, yeah, these are like you know what an Angular build looks like. Uh, ng build the output for that. And uh, yeah, we would whatever output we got, we would sync it to uh, uh, to the S3 bucket or whatever. So like, you can see the command AWS S3 sync. Yeah, very simple. We just copy the thing and. Uh, that was the CI. Uh, that, that's what the CI pipeline looks like. Are there any questions at this point? And, and the, the, I'm going to just uh, you know look at certain sections of the code, uh, Jenkins file code. But if you have any questions before then, yeah. Uh, you got to do that, so um, how do you? So 
you can have a front end build and a back end build, mm -hmm. you run perfectly and all the tests can pass because you've mocked your tests because they're not running off, you know, they shouldn't be running off real off like data or mm -hmm. off, make the database calls, right? So that means that you can essentially get a hundred percent test coverage and hundred percent pass in both of your pipelines, but have data from your back end that isn't what your front end is expecting. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you get around that? Okay, it, um so in this, uh, I, I should say that you know, in this particular project, we didn't really aim for that. Uh, considering the timelines and everything, we didn't really aim for that complete end-to-end -end test pipeline. We attempted that, but timelines didn't allow us. But yeah, uh, the way we were going to approach this was to uh, first of all agreeing on a contract, mm -hmm. uh, front end and back end, and actually stubbing those contracts as uh, files. Uh, sorry, as like specific JSON files which we would use as fixtures on both levels. So on both layers. So back in, uh, on the back end side, we would uh, test the API and check if the API output is similar to what we are expecting from the, from the fixture. And the front end uh, side, it will just use the fixture as it is and render the component. We wanted to achieve a reasonable coverage using this method. Unfortunately, we didn't manage to. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, so I've, I've, I've done it before. I want to know how people are doing it. Okay. Yeah. On the front end, do you check against multiple browsers? Uh, multiple? Multiple browsers. Uh, I think that was not automated. Uh, I could be completely wrong about that. You know, it, it's been a while. But yeah, that test was not automated as much as I can remember. The browser tests. Any, any other questions? Okay, so uh, this now, uh, this is Groovy code, and uh, we'll just walk over some of the relevant sections over here. Um, so, the first thing that we do is check out, and like I said, in Jenkins, you specifically need to check out the repository that you want to use. Uh, so, this line checks out the target repository, this check out a CM. But like I said, you know, we were sharing some common infrastructure code, and this second block of code that you see, the checkout and uh, this whole all these five six lines, that lets us check out another repository which just had additional Groovy files. Uh, so we we split up our Groovy files and uh, put all the common code in this uh, in this repository. So we don't have to update each and every repository that way. Uh, we then, of course, like you know, you can see over here in the last lines that uh, we load the Slack dot Groovy that that we load for every script uh, because Slack notifications are always there, and yeah, just do a little bit more configuration, uh, you know, like setting up the Slack notifier and things like that. Yeah, we also said that you know, uh, in many cases we didn't want to automatically deploy uh, for some of the websites, so we just marked it as not like you know should deploy is false. Uh, this is how we use Docker, and uh, again, so it works off a plugin. But in your Groovy file, this is how you would use it. Uh, you know, you would write some syntax like this, uh, specify the image name. Uh, so we are actually building here. We're not directly using an image. We are building an image, uh, building a Docker file, uh, and going to tag it as Drupal build build ID so that it doesn't get cached. And uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, like you know, when we directly want to use an image, we can just use the syntax docker.image. And like I said earlier, I mean, we are using this image, Drupal QA, PHP 7.1, because it was PHP 7.1 at that time. Uh, Site Factory. Site Factory now supports 7.2, I believe. So we can upgrade, but uh, <laughs> still 7.2. And, uh, you know, similar other com uh, commands like PHP CS and everything. Uh, I mentioned that you know, like we we didn't really escalate certain things as errors, and uh, I think PHP MD was something that we chose that we'll keep tracking it, but not stop the builds for that. Uh, you know, because PHP MD reported things like like I gave an example earlier, cyclomatic complexity being like eleven or twelve, and that was okay. You know, we could live with that for a while. So we just mark the builds as unstable. We would not stop the build. Normally this would stop the build, but you know we have this try catch like structure, very similar to what we have in PHP. So if this PHP, PHP MD command returns a non-zero exit code, 
the pipeline would stop. But because of try catch, it will still continue, but it will just mark the build as yellow. Then, um, oh, I already kind of covered this uh, same thing. This is how we handle failures using this try catch structure. And conditional deployment, you know, we didn't always deploy. We only deploy if we should be deploying, like configured, and on, only on certain branches, not all the branches. Again, this was uh, carried over because of our infrastructure decision. Um, Site factory only supports a limited number of environments, Acquia Cloud in general. So um, I think by default it's three. We got it extended to four for our needs, uh, and uh, but only those four. Uh, so we had a branch mapping. You know, this this branch goes to this particular environment, and only those branches should be deployed. And we just pass that uh, to BLT. BLT does the deployment for the backend for Drupal. <coughs> Excuse me. So. I'd like to leave, uh, leave you with this, you know, um, DevOps is culture first and tools next. Again, I don't need to spend a lot of time talking about this because Kevin did it this morning. Uh, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And you can always reach out to me on Twitter. Twitter is where I'm most active uh, and I'm pretty much, you can just search for Hussein Web anyway. Okay, I think uh, you know if you have any questions later, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Thank you, everyone.